assemble here in the cathedral. Deacon Roger and I, we're talking about pills. Now men our age tend to talk about their aches and pains and what works and doesn't work. You're too young to pay too much attention. But have you ever noticed on TV when they're peddling some new medicine, they'll say it's great, but then they'll say, oh, by the way, your nose may turn orange with purple spots, your teeth may fall out, you might lose fingers or toes. They give you kind of quickly warnings of what it might do. I have an Acura SUV, which I absolutely love. When you put your foot on the gas, it skips. Great sound system. It's got, I like everything about it, except it gives you automatic warnings all the time. In the winter, when it gets below zero, the, the air pressure in your tires goes down. All of a sudden, warning, warning, must increase tire pressure on the front left tire. Orange things, whistles go off. Uh, same thing about uh, having the oil change. I'm pretty good about that, make sure it's done. But you would think the world was going to end. Uh, and it's kind of bothers you. Uh, it, it, uh, it doesn't relent. And God forbid you don't put your seatbelt in. Oh, my goodness. Sinner, sinner, not wearing a seatbelt. Now, in today's gospel, Jesus is giving us some warnings, and he uses some timely things that happened in his time. Uh, Pumptious Pilate, the Roman procurator, who eventually would order the Lord to crucify, was a pretty crummy procurator, insensitive to the Jews. So, one time he put up a big Roman eagle, the symbol of Rome, over the main gate into the temple, the most holy place. Uh, the Jews didn't believe in any images, but to put an eagle over the doors to the temple was drove them crazy. So they rioted, and that's what, especially the Galileans, who tended to be pretty fundamentalist, uh, and that's the scriptures says, Pilate, who mingled the blood of those Galileans with their sacrifices. There was a slaughter. He sent the army into the courts of the temple and killed them. Uh, and they said they must have been terrible sinners. Jesus said they weren't any worse than any other Galileans. And Jesus knew the Galileans. Then there was a tower in Jerusalem that fell down. Again, I read, uh, Pilate took money from the temple treasury. So money that had been dedicated to God for the upkeep of the temple and used it to build an aqueduct. Now the idea of getting more water in Jerusalem was good. Using dedicated money was a mistake. So the Jews assumed when the tower fell down and crushed it, they were probably workmen who were working on that aqueduct. And God struck them dead because they were getting paid with money that belonged to the temple. Jesus said, uh oh, they aren't any worse than any other Israelite. Then he tells that Herod he loved to tell stories. And he said there was a man who had a fig tree in his orchard. He visited him every year, how was he doing? And after three years, it produced no fruit. Now, I looked this up too. Fig trees generally don't start producing fruit that you could eat until about three years. If you had a plant of vineyard, you could eat the grapes the next year, but fig trees take a while. Uh, so the owner of the vineyard was being kind of demanding, but the gardener, he said, oh boss, let me along with this fig tree. Uh, I'll nurture it, I'll take care of it, I'll cultivate it, but if next year it produces no fruit, we'll cut it down and cast it into the God is loving and merciful. God gives us chance after chance to repent. But Jesus was not a feel-good prophet. 
like a good teacher who sometimes asks for more, like a demanding coach who says, you know, you could be winners if you put a little sweat in this. Jesus called us, as he called those folks in his time, to repentance. There's a fancy New Testament word in Greek, it's metanoia. It doesn't just mean change, it means change your whole way of thinking, change your whole way of looking at the world, change your lives. Our faith in Jesus Christ should change everything about us, should make us into new people. We've all heard that term, born again, a new life in Christ. And that new life is filled with hope and promise. So all those deads, those sins that really lead nowhere, in Christ we can let go and then embrace His life of love and service. Lent is the perfect time for that kind of thinking. The Lenten practices are traditional. People have been doing them for 20 centuries. Pray more. Spend a little quality time with the Lord, even if it's just thank you, Lord, or I love you, Lord, or help me, Lord. Or, if it's possible, you might not just go to Mass on Sunday, but come to a daily Mass. Listen to those scriptures. Say prayers you can say, easy prayers, but say them. Get to know your best friend, who is Christ. And then, obviously, we don't, I should fast for all sorts of reasons, but the idea of fasting is to remember people who are hungry, to get a little bit less for ourselves, just a little bit, so we can give more to our neighbor. There's lots of suffering in this world, which most of us ignore most of the time. So to give up some treat, to make a little happy penance, put that money in the poor box, is a great thing to do. And then to do those acts of love that we all have opportunities for. To be nice to that kid in school that other people ignore. To visit your grandma in the nursing home. To uh, make a difference by showing Christ's love to one another. Metanoia. And God will bless us when we imitate his gospel. And we really are on the road to perish, to a life without meaning or love, when we resist the opportunities to change.